All right, guys. Well, this is uh, this is our first uh, first try at a podcast. Uh, we're going to do more of these. The goal of of our podcast is to uh, just kind of get you uh, in touch, or or, or where you can ha- kind of have a feel like you're having a conversation with influential people in the motorsports industry. It's obviously specific to drag racing. Um, Ga- and this is Eric Gash. Gash has been uh, a part of our program for a couple of years, and really even long. And I just has been, always been a good friend. Um, he was uh, really. What, what was your title at at Haltech? Well, I had several titles at Haltech. I worked in sales and tech, and I was office manager, and then I was general manager, and then I was uh, a manager of motorsports. Yep. So he, yeah, how many years were you there? Fifteen years. Long time, long time. Really, that's that's a, a really impressive. Yeah. So, um, and obviously that's how we got to do Gash was just through Haltech uh, to kind of give you a, a geographical thing. You're really only what an hour and twenty from? Oh, well, yeah, about an hour, hour, a little over an hour. Well, yeah, a little fuzz over an hour. So we're we're in Lexington. So yeah, Haltech's in Lexington, and I live in Lexington. Yeah, and then we're in Northern Kentucky. That's where Ten Soldiers at. So, um, kind of part of when we really started working together was honestly geographically it really made sense, uh, and we were already helping a lot of the same people so it just made sense i think when we really got to know you guys we knew you before this we really got to know you guys was when you were running the white um sn95 car in limited 235 yeah or dsp 235 or whatever it was yeah it had a couple different names. yeah but when you guys were running that that series and then um you all eventually won uh, one of those championships and i think that was in the middle of 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 covet and you guys came down and we had that because because Haltech had sponsored that, yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that class or sponsored that series um, with um, with John Sears, and um, and we wanted to do a, a banquet or a, an award ceremony. Well, we couldn't do that because they didn't have a PRI show or whatever. Well, hey, Trell, are you going to join us? Hey, puppy dog. Um, uh, two 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 guys and a dog. <laughs> yeah, yeah, two guys and a dog. But anyway, um, so. We wanted to do that awards uh, thing for the for the two thirty five deal. Well, we cu- we couldn't do that because PRI show didn't happen, and all you know there was nobody was getting together for yeah, nobody. Yeah. So so we just had a um, you know off off the books off the record uh, luncheon down at uh, down at Haltech, and we did a little awards thing for you guys. And I remember John came in, John yeah. Sears came into town, and and um, Martin and the guys and a bunch of the other two thirty five racers came and and. Um, Oh, we had Mar- yeah, Martin protested our win. He did, yeah. He protested he win. <laughs> uh, I'm sure. <laughs> and uh, all I remember is we had barbecue, and it was good. It was awesome. That yeah. was a that was, was a fun day. Mm-hmm. And then I do remember how tech where you wrote us a check. That was yeah. yeah well, yeah, somebody did. Yeah, yeah so I did. Yeah, somebody yeah, gave us a check for, for your uh, for your championship. <laughs> and uh, and then we started uh, started talking a lot more after that. Yeah, it was really good. Mm-hmm. And I built a car. I was building a car. I built a car after that. And that, actually, I think we were in the middle of building it then. Yeah, yeah, so, we uh, you were back at the work run, then mm-hmm. shortly thereafter we built you an eight eight, built an eight eight, and then we built a, and then you guys built a nine inch for later. Yep. So and and really like um, now uh, Gash is doing his own thing, uh, and we'll kind of get into that as we we talk more. But um, really, what, how how did you get into cars? What made you mm. you know what made you go down that <clears throat> path? Mm, that's a good question. I guess when I was. Um, when I was a kid, when I was young, I was into uh, radio-controlled airplanes, RC model airplanes. Those are sweet. Yeah, yeah little gas-powered ones and stuff. And I, I like the mechanical bits of it, the little servo motors, and interestingly enough, all the electronics and the, the little um, you know radio control, handheld controllers, and and I like the little engines. And I took them apart and put them back together, and I built all these different airplanes. And so I did that when I was, you know, I don't know, from ten until maybe thirteen or fourteen years old or something like that. I did that for like three or four years. And um, <clears throat> had fun with that, but then you know all of a sudden I turned sixteen and I got a car, and then oh, I'm not going to mess with airplanes anymore. I, you know, I'm, I can drive. Yeah. I can drive, <laughs> right? Yeah. So, um, um, so anyway, yeah, my first, uh, my first car, actually my first car, and I wish I still had it, was an '85 Mercury uh, Marquis, not a Grand Marquis, but a Mercury Marquis, which yeah. is which is the Mercury. It's the sister car of the. Um, of the Ford um, Fairmont, Fa- Fairmont, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a, it's a, it's a Ford uh, Fairmont. It's, it's, uh, it's the exact same thing. And um, I wish I still had it. Was my, gra- it literally was my grandmother's car. 
<laughs> That's and cool. uh, yeah, I think we gave Nanny five hundred bucks for it or something, and I drove it around, and it was um, it was it was, it was poop brown, and um, I can say poop right. I guess we're going to edit this so we can say whatever we want, right? Yeah, no, right. <laughs> no, it was uh, it was it was brown as they come and um, brown and tear, brown on brown on brown. It was awesome. I wish I still had it. I definitely built a drag car out of it now for sure. Yeah. Um, because I, I had no idea that you know that thing would have had a four well, like eight eight in it, and well, yeah, it was a six cylinder, so it probably had a seven. seven yeah, we could swap, but it, whatever, yeah, we could yeah, swap yeah. it out and and. Um, but yeah, that was my first car. And then, well, I, I didn't really get into cars until my second car when I was 17 or 18. Um, I bought a, um, uh, my dad helped me buy a, it was a Mitsubishi uh, Eclipse, which was a, um, one of these cars from the early 90s. And, you know, it was a bit, a bit sportier than, Grandma's so you were in the DSMs first? I, I was a DSM guy. Yeah, that's where I started. Actually, was was DSMs. But my first one was the like front wheel drive non turbo one point. Oh, it's terrible. 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 Yeah, yeah, it's the one you don't want. But I didn't know anything. About <laughs> that, you know? I just knew that you thought the chicks liked the eclipses. Yeah. Turns out, yeah. <laughs> turns out they end up driving them. But that's what I was <laughs> yeah. But uh, you know, we can edit that out. But um, anyway, um, no. It turns out that. That the one you wanted um, was was turbocharged and all wheel drive, and I didn't know what any of that was at the time because you know I was seventeen you, years old. And, and you were into air, the remote. The only thing, yeah, yeah, exactly. And so um, I'd never really been into any of that stuff, but I um, ended up wrecking that first car that I had, the, uh, the first Eclipse that I had. Um, rolled it over just on a country road or whatever. Just, you probably just got done watching Fast and the Furious, and well, no, that movie had. Oh, I had it. Oh, sorry, I forgot you were that, older than me. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, that hadn't come out yet. No, it was um, it was graduation night of my junior year in high school, so I hadn't graduated, but but we were um, it was just you know driving home or driving to a friend's house or something, and hit a curb and flipped that thing over and totaled it. You have to spice that story up, you know what I mean? So <clears throat> I called my dad. And um, I called my parents because I, oh, actually, I, I, I didn't realize I was upside down until I, you know, hit the seat belt and then landed on the roof, you know. And gosh, it's been a long time since I told that story. Um, yeah, of course, there's glass everywhere and the whole thing's smashed to bits. And, you know, I really like that car because, you know, when, when I first got that car, you know, coming from like, you know, sort of, you know, poop brown grandma mobile, um, Mercury Marquis, LTD, whatever you what LTD or Fairmont, whatever you want to call it. Um, I had, um, you know, got into this, you know, Japanese sports car thing and the, and the, and the, the um, you know, steering wheel and the console wrapped around you. And, you know, it was, it was sporting. I, I like that car. It felt like a race car driver. It felt like a race car driver. I mean, absolutely. Yeah. With all, all of 85 horsepower or whatever it had at the time. <laughs> and um, so anyway, um, after I totaled that car, the next, spent the next summer and, and had learned more about those cars learned that they had you know the one that i had was the the lowest possible model and that they had you know better better faster ones you know available and and uh, ended up finding an all-wheel drive turbo um, stick shift version of that same car um funnily enough from the same guy that that i bought from the same little car lot there in lawrenceburg that um where i grew up that um that we had bought the first one from and um kevin was the guy's name you know, there's car salesmen and there are guys that sell cars. And yeah. He wasn't a car salesman. He was just a guy that sold cars. Just a guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, he was awesome. <laughs> and, um, yeah, he didn't care one way, one way or another. He didn't care one way or another whether he bought the car or not. It didn't matter. <laughs> anyway, he was cool. So we bought this uh, turbocharged all-wheel drive. It's called a Mitsubishi Eclipse GSX, and that's the one you wanted, I guess. Well, anyway, I spent the next years and years and years working on that thing, and I met some of my oldest car buddies. Uh, I've got a buddy, Bill um walls who i've been friends he's he's my oldest car buddy not because he's the most advanced in age but because he's he's he was my first car buddy you know and i, I met him because this was before facebook this was before forums this was when we had um had a mailing list at the time and so you get an email every day and everyone asked their questions on this email and you put your question on there and send it back out and then you had to wait till the next day for some guy to compile all the answers and send it back out in an email that wow. that, that predated forums and all yeah. that stuff. And so phones still had cords back then. Phones still had cords okay, back then. Yeah, yeah. Um, 
we had um, carrier pigeons. Uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, no, it was great. Uh, it was Morse code. Um, to, uh, Seems rough to be a car guy back then. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but at least I didn't start with carburetors. Like, you know, at least it was fuel injected and yeah, turbocharged. So, you know, you know, you're already offending half the audience. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, no, no, my, my, my start in cars wasn't, was not uh, unlike a lot of my peers actually. And that's probably what, what's, what led me into some of my career was my start in, in cars was not in carbureted V8s. It was in fuel injected turbocharged four cylinders. Yeah. Particularly those Mitsubishis. And so that's, that's what I, you know, cut my teeth on, so to speak. That's what I, that's what I, you know, those are the cars that I learned. You know, I learned, I learned more, I learned how turbochargers work before I learned how, a carburetor works. I still don't know how a carburetor works. Do you? I don't know. Anyway, does anyone? <laughs> I don't know. Anyway, um, <clears throat> but no, I um, started with that and then started learning how to modify these cars. And we learned that, you know, we didn't need a bigger motor. We needed a bigger turbo. Yeah. And so you put a bigger turbo on these things and they were fast. And we ended up, man, I, I, I built, rebuilt and rebuilt and built and rebuilt that car a bunch of times. And eventually, uh, I, you know, we eventually ran like 1030s or something, which, you know, in 2001 or something, that was, that was pretty quick. Yeah, it was fast. And, but, um, you know, and then I, and then I got out of that, um, sold that thing off and got out of the, the Mitsubishi four cylinder game and bought, I was going to buy, I was going to buy a V8. Actually, I went through a brief phase where I was going to do, uh, 2J stuff with the, the Toyota 2J yeah. motor, which was a fantastic engine, but, um, um, actually bought a um i didn't have enough money for a supra at the time so i bought a lexus sc300 which is what yeah. is this for yeah it's a similar chassis but a little bigger a little heavier but you know i was going to build a race car out of it and use a 2j and um then um i ended up i ended up pulling a plug on that decided i, I didn't want to do that because i had I'd always wanted a um um either a cobra mustang or a corvette you know i was into street car stuff at the time and and um went and test drove um some cobras and um that w and when i say cobra i'm referring to the like 0304 cobras, yeah yeah um terminator cars yeah, that's cool. which are awesome and so this would have been like um early mid mid 2000s 2005 six something like that and um i ended up um instead of buying i ended up buying a corvette because the insurance was cheaper actually versus a cobra mustang the, the insurance on the corvette and you know of course i at the time i'd have been early 20s or something and so um i um bought my first corvette which was a silver 2000 um, automatic c5 and um i remember how hard it was to get my mitsubishi to run tens and i took that corvette and did like a camshaft a set of headers and shot a nitrous and went 1090s with it it was just like it was way easier it was an ls motor right yeah. so i didn't know it was a rear wheel drive it was rear wheel drive and it was an automatic and i put a stall converter in and stuff and learned about all that sort of stuff actually a fresh pair of new balances and um yeah actually yeah yeah trailing you're growling out girl why are you growling out are you getting worked up you started growling we started talking about new balances you know what do you what do you like you like adidas or what <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's how I got started with the LS motors. And, um, you know, and, and I remember one of the guys that I worked with at the time, um, you know, cause he, he, this guy I worked with, he had done a bunch of Honda stuff or whatever. And I st started messing around with these LS motors and we, I don't know, we put a camshaft in it and, you know, we eventually sprayed some nitrous on it, but we eventually put a turbo on, put like a 76 millimeter turbo on this Corvette. And, um, I don't remember how much power, it, but it went, it went, you know, it ran tens, you know, sort yeah. of, yeah, which was or 600 horsepower, you know, street car thing. And, um, and the guys I was hanging around with at the time, a lot of import guys, and they were just amazed at how easily these things would make five or 600 horsepower, which versus, you know, you'd have to really, you know, string out a two liter to make that kind of. Yeah. Money. It's a lot. It's a lot more money too, really. It, yeah. And we got, it really got me thinking, oh, well, you know, I can take what I know of, uh, about these, you know, what I learned in the turbocharging world on these smaller motors and apply the same principles to, you know, a larger motor to a, you know, LS motor, or at that point, you know, it could have been a small block forward or a, you know, yeah. whatever, it doesn't matter. Yeah. Just apply those same sort of principles, hang a big turbo off of it and fuel inject it and put, put some kind of good control system on it. And, and, um, you know, away you go. And, uh, you know, if you can make, if you can make 500 horsepower with two liters, then you can make 1500 horsepower with, with six liters. Right. So, yeah, absolutely. And, and so, um, I started going down that path and I had a, 
couple of Corvette race cars and, um, um, I had a white, I had a white one that, um, that was pretty fast. I, I built that white. You, did you ever see the white Corvette? Yeah, that's what I met you when you had the white. I had that one, that white C5. Yeah. Um, so where did, I, uh, I, I, go ahead. I built that car with the intention of trying to run sevens. Never did. I went eight flat at 180 or something and a quarter. And, uh, I sold it. As soon as I sold it, they put a fresh set of tires on it. I think went seven eighties or something. Yeah. Like it, it had it in it. You know, it was just, but what were you going to ask? So along those lines of like this timeline of figuring out your car, you know, all your car hobby, all that stuff. Where did, when did how tech come in? Uh, yeah. Um, so I started there in Oh seven. Okay. I started how in 2007. When did they come to America? Um, well, see, Haltech came to America. Actually, they Haltech was in America. Um, they were in the United States back in the early '90s, um, back when the original owner, um, uh, still when he was when he was still alive, his name was Bill, uh, Bill. I can't remember his last name. But anyway, um, of course, I never knew him. But yeah, um, but by the time I joined the company, he had already passed, and and then it had his widow had sold the company to. Um, uh, you know, who became the, the, the leader, the owner that I worked for. And, um, so, um, they had an office in Texas in the early nineties. That was probably, uh, I don't, I don't remember it. I, you know, this, it predates me working there, but it, it was probably, um, open from, you know, the mid early nineties until the late nineties or early two thousands when, um, when, when, when Bill passed and then, <coughs> excuse me, um, I know that they reopened an office in the United States in 2004. Um, okay, and that was that's the the company that is Haltech USA now. It was, was that in Lexington? No, they? no, no. They were in California when they first opened in okay. 2004. So they were in California for three years, and then um, I joined the company. Um, but I wasn't I wasn't general manager at the time. The general manager at the time. Well, uh, Matt Wright was um, who had worked for Haldex for a long time. He was working in California, and um, we moved the office. He had, he went back to Australia. He was Australian. He went back to Australia, and um, myself and um, uh, the boss at the time, his name was Steve, and I worked for him and worked for Haldex USA in Lexington. We moved the the office from California to Lexington in '07. That's when I started. Okay, um, and you know I was working in sales and tech and. Um, I don't remember exactly what I was hired for, but I ended up, you know, s- selling e- ECUs. And of course, the the stuff that we were selling at the time then was was nowhere near as good as the stuff that they have now. It was, you know, just and really back there. Probably was it you, was was Haltech at all in the drag racing at all at the time? Maybe some import stuff, yeah, but but not nothing on the domestic side. Yeah, I don't think we we did anything on the V8 side um, at the time. We were selling mostly four cylinder stuff and six cylinder stuff, and and some of the older. Um, uh, gosh, what were the names of those ECUs? E8s and E11s. And they were just, um, uh, ECUs just, just weren't that, you know, they weren't anywhere near as capable as the current system. Uh, but they got, they got the company through a, through a period. And then, then they came out with, a um, sports series ECUs. I remember I was there for the launch of that series. That was a popular ECU that was in like, um, say, oh, eight, oh, nine, something like that. Okay. Um, when that sport the platinum platinum series platinum sport series sport 1000 sport 2000 a couple of smaller boxes we sold those gosh up until 2013 or 14 or something like that and then so that's when the elite ecus came out they were much much better um and then we that's where around about that time sort of the late 2000 2010 11 12 something like that so when i remember i went over to australia to have a business meeting and I was talking with the management over there and, um, yeah, all good friends of mine, you know, we, we all worked together for a long time. They're all like brothers. And, um, um, uh, I told him, I said, I, I said, guys, we need to do V8 stuff. And, and the Australians, they're like, no, 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 we don't need to do any V8 stuff. You know, you've got reflashes for the V8s. And I'm like, no, 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 guys, you don't get it. We need to do V racing V8s with big turbochargers on them. These guys are, this, this stuff is hot. You know, like we need, we need to get to it. No, no, no. Australians, are, they weren't convinced. I said, well, I don't care, guys. I'm going to do it. So I came back, and we just started focusing on doing a bunch of V8 stuff, and um, uh, met a bunch of influential people in the in the V8 world, and uh, started getting got into um, uh, some V8 drag racing, and we did some pro mod stuff, and 
we did some, and then it just sort of spiraled from there. We sort of did more and more and more um, on that side. And then the elite ECUs came out, and that that helped a lot because those ECUs were actually a lot more capable. Um, and then we got involved in uh, some of the straight outlaw stuff. Um, got involved with some of those guys. Um, that was in that would have been in like 2015, 16, something like yeah. that. And um, you know, we helped out a couple of those guys, Doc and Dominator and Kamikaze. They're all friends of mine, and and um, I still talk to all those guys to this day. Matter of fact, I talked to Doc a couple hours ago. Yeah, yeah you were working. You helped, know, helped, you helped you him with some yeah. 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 just we, we weren't tuning on anything. We were just looking over some data or something. So he's getting ready for the No Prep King season. So um, um, we got that. Like I said, I still got relationship with those guys. And then the Nexus ECUs came out. Right in the middle of 2020, the first Nexus ECU came out. 2021 or something like that. It's probably 2020 because I think it was 2020. Yeah, when we came when we came down, I think we saw you might have had a maybe a blank box or something that. Yeah, I don't remember exactly what it was, but something. Yeah, I mean, we kind of talked about about it yeah. and COVID fog for 2020. Yeah, yeah, yeah 2020. Kind of, kind of forget where yeah, everything, where it was where, where everything happened, but anyway, the Nexus ECU line so, came out. And so really, it's really really good. And we you, we can cut this or leave it or however you want to do it. But so I would almost credit you with helping Haltech really get into drag racing. Man, no, that's not true. We did a lot of drag racing before I ever did any V8 stuff. They were they were drag just racing. import drag racing. They were doing a lot of import drag racing. Two J's, um, um, Mitsubishi stuff, um, the uh, Toyota uh, four cylinder stuff. Uh, well before before I ever got involved in any of that, yeah. and a lot of serious guys on that. They were they were involved yeah, over in Australia, really racers, yeah. over in Australia and the United States and in Puerto Rico as well. I remember before we ever did any V eight stuff, uh, we went down to Puerto Rico and we. We um, did a lot of uh, import drag racing in the United States before we ever did any of that, and that a lot of that stuff existed well before me. So, um, as as far, as far as the push, the the real push to do V eight stuff, um, I mean, I mean, yeah, I was definitely uh, involved in pushing the company and pushing Haltech to want to do V eight stuff, and I had to get those guys on board. Yeah. Obviously, it's a huge part of what they do now. Um, I, I wouldn't, couldn't, wouldn't take. Yeah, I do. Any all the credit. Uh, I mean, maybe. But I would give you a little bit. Definitely maybe a little bit. Yeah, based on the story. Um, no, that's the, that. You know, I, I don't. There is some truth to that story, though, um, about those guys not wanting to do any of the VA stuff. I remember uh, Mark, Mark, or one of the guys that uh, Mark was the owner at the time. I don't remember if it was Mark or Matt. Or one of the guys. No, 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 we never need to. So no, that we we definitely need to do V eight stuff. Yeah, and it's not that we didn't. It just wasn't a focus, you know. Yeah, and. Um, and then uh, we just had to, you know, kind of be bullheaded Americans and just do it and prove it to them. And, show them. and they came around, you know, but, um, and obviously it's a huge part of. Yeah, absolutely. A uh, huge part of the business now. What, so as like, I think race car electronics is something that's, it's just evolved so much. Oh, yeah. And I think it, it, it was just based on your timeline when you started to, to kind of when you ended that sector of your career path. Um, what do you think the biggest thing that changed was it? You know, obviously the the products changed, but do you think the consumer, the itself, uh, you know, as a person changed? Like, what what do you think some of the biggest gains and how it was navigated in the electronics side specifically? Yeah. Um, I think for me, integrating the control. The, the integrating the fuel injection fuel injection and ignition control with the data logging with the boost control with power management with the everything else on the car that needs to be like controlled whether that's a transmission like a sh- shifting a transmission or you know air shocks or you know um, uh, I don't know whatever yeah uh, uh, other things that all need to be run together so prior to the, this sort of evolution that we've seen in, in the electronics over the last four, five, six years, prior to that, you'd need a, um, you know, to build it, to do it, run a normal race car, you know, a typical race car 10 years ago, let's say, you need a switch panel of some kind. And this is, this is assuming it was, you know, assuming it was fuel injected. And, you know, yeah, lay, we're not talking carburetor stuff. <laughs> I wouldn't know how to talk about <laughs> yeah. carburetor stuff, but um, no, no, no. Um, 
so you know at that time you'd need um you know like a switch panel and some sort of an efi unit and maybe an ignition box and you know maybe the two would work together or maybe they wouldn't and then you'd probably need like a data logger separate you know very common to have all the race packs a race pack yeah very common to have that and so and then you might need a separate boost controller. So it's really common to see. Bump box. You'd need a, yeah, a bump. If it's a turbocharged car, you need a bump box. Or if it's a nitrous car, you'd need some sort of a nitrous controller or a bunch of timers to run your nitrous system and stuff like that. And so for me, um, what, what I think the biggest advantage now that we have is that there's multiple systems on the market, uh, you know, whether it's a Haltech or Holly or a Fuel Tech or, you know, they're, they, they've all got systems where they've integrated a lot of that stuff together so that you've got not only your engine control, but you can also shift the transmission and you can do the power management and you can manage the nitrous kits or you can manage the boost or you, you know, and you don't have to have a bunch of different, you know, control systems yeah. that don't necessarily work that well together. And so it's simplified the wiring, it's sped everything up. I, I, I think it's helped make the cars work better because all, you know, it's everything's working you know, as, as one control system, um, as opposed to having, you know, multiple different, you know, multiple different, um, uh, what we used to call back, back in the import world, um, back before we had good electronics, it was the same thing. They had multiple boxes. You might've had a, uh, oh gosh, what were they called? An Apex AFC and a GS, HKS, VPC and GCC. Oh, they called it alphabet soup because that's what it was. It was just all these different acronyms for all this stuff yeah. that you'd have to put on a car. And um, I think the the biggest benefit that we have now, the last you know four or five six years, is um, how the ECU manufacturers aren't, are no longer just controlling the engine. Yeah, they're um, uh, running everything. You know, running. Yeah, running it's more the, of a total, total package. Total package. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So you, you know, um, so sort of gone are the days where you needed all sorts of different you know components from all these different people. Now, there's still a lot of companies that make those individual individual controllers and, and they, they work well and and there are there are some there are some you know instances where it may be advantageous to use a, a separate controller for one thing you know if you're if you're accustomed to um the way it works the way it works or you've got tune-ups for that particular thing or something like that you know you might but um but it's not absolutely necessary so i think that's um i think that's probably one of the biggest advantages i think also um just the speed of the technology now you know the 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 speed. Of, I'm not a I'm not an IT guy, so I couldn't tell you you know how many gigabits the processor. I don't know. I just know that the stuff it works it fast. works fast. Yeah, yeah. You know it's faster than it's faster than the stuff was ten years ago. Yeah, we're not. Ago. We don't have dial up internet. <laughs> right. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> well, right. I mean, you know, we've got ECUs now with like Wi-Fi communication, so you don't even have to be plugged into it. I mean, yeah, that's Brad's I mean, favorite part of the yeah of the ECU. Yeah, you don't even He's have got to, his own password and everything. Yeah, exactly. You know. um We've got ECUs now that you know you've got a a keypad and it can run the the headlights and taillights and and um, you know all the fans. Oh, it's and amazing and what it, it does. I mean, There's all that stuff, mm-hmm. and so and also obviously run the engine too. Yeah. So. Do you think you know that's intimidating for people? Do you th- I think the wiring can be intimidating for people? Um, I, I I I know that because I you know I end up doing a lot of wiring jobs since. Since I left Haltech and started my own uh, my own business, a lot of what I do is, is wiring harness stuff and and um, um, you know installation stuff like that. And I know just just looking at a big you know big ball of a wiring harness that's getting ready to be put in a race car can be intimidating. Now, if if you're holding one single wire, that's not intimidating. You know, if you say okay, that's a red wire with a blue stripe and that does that. Okay, that's all right. I get it. But when you when you have you know 150 of those, yeah, it can probably get intimidating. Of, gosh, what do I do with all that? And how do uh, I was talking to one of the guys at the shop today, and he looked, he was looking at all the stuff we had laid out on the on the um, on that table, w- yeah. t- table. and, and that was, was nothing compared to the not, first three. right? Yeah, no, it yeah. was just some connectors and some wires. He's like, man, I don't even know where to start. And I'm like, well, no, but you don't know where to start when you start anything. Like, yeah, you know, it's like a, a car's complicated, but every sim- every piece of the car. You know, if you look at if you break a car down into each of the individual little pieces, they're all quite simple. Now it gets complicated when you put all that stuff together. But you know, a bolt is simple. There's a lot of bolts that hold a car together. You know, yeah. A um, you know a piston is simple. A 
spring is simple. A switch is simple. But when you start putting all that stuff together is, yeah, it can probably get overwhelming. You have to understand how it all works. But once you understand how it all works, then um, it becomes less intimidating. It becomes a lot more simple. Um, big part of what I do, in addition to the wiring stuff, is um, uh, trainings. I do I do Haltech uh, training seminars. Um, but I, I do my seminars a little bit differently. Um, I do one-on-one seminars. So instead of, um, you know, instead of getting 15 guys in a classroom and talking for two days, I, I, I did a bunch of those when I was working for Haltech. I did those for years and years. And, and, and they're good, but the problem is you get, like if you get 15 car guys in a, in a, in a room for two days, uh, number one, they're going to all want to talk about their cars and yeah. that sort of thing, which is fun. You know, that's great. But, you know, you're, 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 you know, you're there to learn. And um, but the other thing is, you know, you've got guys that are, you know, understand this much and guys that understand this much. Yeah, they're definitely not sort of the same level. And, you know, these guys may be bored and these guys may be lost. And so um, I had the idea, well, what if we do one-on-one seminars? I, it's not a revolutionary idea. Other people have done it before, but um, what what I offer instead of doing long format seminars where you do a whole day or two days, um, I broke it up into two or three hour chunks, so it's yeah, all it's all, it's all the same stuff that you teach in a two a two day seminar, but it's just two or three hours at a time. Yeah, and so um, I've been doing these starting the beginning of this year, so I've been doing it for about five months, and um, I've done several of them in England. Um, uh, most of them I do remotely, so you know, log into the customer's computer and we do a, a Zoom thing, and and I, I can record. It's not actually through Zoom; it's through. Um, uh, forget what puzzle I use but anyway um we can record it and then when it's over I send it to the um also you know, they set back and watch they it. go back and watch their own thing so if they if they forget the thing that I said you know whatever they can go to that part of the um of the seminar and re- re-listen to it or if they have a question you know they could you know they can email me or call me or something so, yeah that's great hey, hey what did you mean by this or whatever works out pretty well and so you know and so instead of having a you know two-day seminar for you know, a bunch of money and a bunch of time, and you know, by the end of it, you're you know, brain dead because you you took so much took so much in. The way I did it, I broke it up. Is um, you know, you do your intro, you do your introductory class, and then you do the you know the setup class, and then the the um, you know more advanced stuff, and and you basically it's an a la carte menu. You, you can go to my website and look at all the different options, and that you know the prices range, and you know it's and the, and the the length of duration of time ranges and i'm really flexible with it too um i've had some customers that just say hey you know i just need to know about this stuff and this stuff and i say okay no problem well, I, can tell you, I can teach you all that stuff too. yeah and so so from that like like just deal with people when obviously i mean you've been in the efi world for over 15 years now what do you, what do you think the biggest like misconception of it is i'm probably hard to pick one but the biggest misconception of EFI, I mean, just just that brain box in general. Like, what 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 is the biggest misconception? Okay, okay. So, what, what's the fellow that works for the fabricator guy? Todd. Todd. Um, I couldn't remember his name, but yeah, Todd. So Todd was the guy who said, he said, "Man, I w- I wouldn't even know where to start." And so I um, like, like you 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 said it's the the mysterious black brain box thing or whatever you know. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's. That's that's the biggest misconception is it's not a mysterious black brain box thing. It, it's a box of switches. Yeah, I, it, it's that's all it really is. You know, I don't. No matter whose it is, whether it's a, any of the, any of the brands of ECUs or an OEM ECU, whatever, all it is is a box of switches that turns stuff on and off. I mean, yeah, it's got a microprocessor in it. It's got you know all sorts of cool, neat features or whatever. But when you boil it down to it, it's a processor and a bunch of switches that turn stuff on and off. Yeah, and that's. At the core of it, you have to understand that. Well, that's really all that thing's doing is it's turning injectors on and off, and it's turning coils on and off, and it's turning fuel pumps and fans and whatever else you got hooked up to it. You know, it's turning all that stuff on and off. Yeah. And yeah, it may have like, you know, some really advanced cool stuff like Wi-Fi or CAN communication or all this cool stuff, and that's great. But it's still just, you know, when you boil it down, it's just a device that turns stuff on and off, and you just have to understand that that's its that's its purpose in life, and. Um, the whole point of the software and all that stuff is to let you teach it you what know, it needs to know, what it needs to do, you know, give it, give it the information that it needs to be able to do that accurately. And so, you know, it's not some mysterious, you know, black box of, 
you know, witchcraft voodoo, you know, that, that can't be understood or known. It's, it's yeah. yeah, people designed it and it's, you know, they're, um, what I see a lot of people now, like, uh, like the class, the class debate in no prep is like a really big thing right now. Like, like how to divide stuff, how to, you know, as, as cars are getting faster. And I've seen a bunch of posts, uh, you know, about people like, oh, they, you know, you should ban traffic control. You should do all this stuff. And I think a lot of it comes from a place like, <clears throat> I'm not picking on it. He's probably carbureted nitrous guys, but uh, now, 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 now you're the one pissing off happy. Yeah, 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 it's Friday. <laughs> but, but at the end of the day, it's, it, I think, um, I think there is, uh, you know, people that are kind of scared to embrace this technology, uh, even though we've had it for a long time now. Hmm. Um, and in my opinion, and I'm interested on your take on this, but like, I think, you know the mo the people that are going to be successful for years to come are the ones that gravitate and 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 whether they know it or not right now they go to classes like what you're offering stuff like that to where they can really start to grab hold of this stuff uh and and, and understand it better mm -hmm. you know because there's just no like once once that's been opened you can't put it back in the box right like that ball is already rolling <clears throat> Yeah, I've seen some of the posts that you're talking about of guys saying, well, just, you know, you shouldn't have trash control. You shouldn't have this. You shouldn't have that. Well, okay, so what shouldn't you have? You shouldn't have beadlock wheels. Yeah. You know, you shouldn't have uh, disc brakes. You know, you shouldn't have, uh, you know, I don't know, uh, electronic shift, you know, uh, electronic shifters or, you know, a yeah. automatic shifter. You shouldn't have. Where do you start? Where do you stop taking the technology away? Why, why is, why, why is that, you know, why is that one thing? And, and I think, I think you, you hit on it because it's an understanding of it. Yeah. And there are a lot of people are using that to their advantage. And, you know, if you're not, well, then I, th I think you're missing a big valuable tool in your, in your, in your toolbox. Yeah. Well, and I think it's so, we're, <clears throat> we're, we're building a car for a guy right now and, and I love, and he's awesome, man. Great, great dude. And we were kind of having this similar discussion uh, and he's like, you know, he was looking at Charlie and just all the sensors and stuff that we were on on it. And he was kind of talking to Brad and talking to me. And he's like, he's like, you know, I just, I don't get it. He's like, I have so much enjoyment of, you know, trying to make my car do what it needs to do going down the racetrack while I'm driving it. And I'm like, man, we're not doing anything differently than what you're doing. We're just the joy and the, and the, you know, the, the, the sense of satisfaction uh, is knowing that you, did whatever you can do in the computer to help that car get down the racetrack. So it's, it's almost you and Brad are kind of similar that way. Like he always had remote control cars. You said you had the airplane. And I think both That's of funny, you, I didn't know that. Yeah. You uh, kind of both uh, look at it this, in a similar mm -hmm. uh, regard of like, you know, and you obviously you drive your car. Uh, you like to drive it. Uh, you probably would be okay with not driving it though. Right. You like, you like watching it go down the racetrack. I like both actually. Yeah. Yeah. And where, you know, like Brad's kind of like, I always say I'm just a monkey that left to go of a button because that he, you know, he tries to make it so that I don't have to drive it. You do the same thing for yourself. You want to be able to let go of the button in the car, do what you've asked it to do. And then if there's something that happens in the middle of that, hopefully, you know, technology overrides it and mm -hmm. fixes it and gets it down through there. Um, but yeah. And it generally does. Yeah. And it does. Yeah. yeah absolutely. Does. Yeah. Um, yeah. We've got a pretty, um, pretty good record with of going down the racetrack absolutely with, with, with my car. and that's the thing i think that people <clears throat> that mysterious box that like you see like if you pick on the trash control debate like it it's that's most of that stuff doesn't make you any faster it is a it it's more or less a fail safe right if if something happens yeah it, it catches yeah. it and we can still get the round win yeah um yeah is yeah more yeah so than anything yeah it's uh it's uh what do they call it when they have the trap a net you know yeah the trapeze artist you know you know fall off the thing and, you know i i've never i've so i've got i was i was sitting here thinking of how many mics you're i was like i was sitting here thinking about how many laps i've made on on that blue mustang of mine since we finished it um a couple hundred probably so i know we made not 80 88 the first year and that about next year the let so we probably made 80 or 90 laps each year yeah and we're in the third year and we've made several so we're approaching 200 
and I, I haven't, I have, I've never not run all of the, um, torque management, trash control, boost control, um, you know, all, all of the, 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 the functionality that's, that's in the ECU that I've got all set up because, you know, if it, if it does spin the tire, sure, I can lift off the throttle. Yep. But the computer's faster than I am. It's so better. It's, it's better at than I am. Yeah. So, um, I know my limits as a driver and I'm, I'm better on a laptop than I'm driving. I, I love, I love letting go. I love being the monkey that lets go of the button. That, it's fun. Yeah, absolutely. You, you know, it's fun. Yeah. You know, um, but, um, um, but I know that that thing can see wheel speed and wheel slip and drive shaft RPM and all the different stuff that we're using to, 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 to control it. And I, I know they can see it, record it and start cutting power faster than, yeah. uh, you know, it's faster, faster than, than I can let off the throttle. I, I know that cause I see it in the data logs. Absolutely. I can see yeah. it in the data. I can see it start to start to cut before, um, before I've ever, you know, done anything with the pedal. And I've, I, yeah, you, you, you actually have to learn how to drive it like that too. Yeah. It's because, a different thing because you have to let it do its thing. You have to trust it enough to do it, to do yeah. its thing, um, and drive through it a lot of times. And, um, uh, and just let it, you know, kick and pop and, you know, whatever and chatter and then you know, yeah, drop through, through it. it. Yeah. It's, it's definitely like, I love, uh, like, it's kind of funny. Like, uh, like Brad and I's done dynamic that I drive the car and he tunes it. Um, I can't lie about anything. I can't stretch the truth. About no, it because he's got it. Like yeah, they, everything you know, on the dialogue. Yeah. 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 And, and, and I think that may be part of it for some people. You know what I mean? Like you can no longer be like, I drove it to the edge. Well, no, actually you didn't. No, no, yeah, no, no, <laughs> no, you pedal it three times. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah. okay. If you had to pedal it, yeah, it's, it's fine. fine. Yeah, it's fine. But, yeah. But, yeah. It's, it's yeah. just funny. Mm -hmm. Well, well to kind of change, uh, not total directions, but, um, so what what are you doing now? What obviously you've transitioned from the business? Yeah. What what's what what is Eric Gash doing now? What what how can people use what you're doing? Right. Yeah. So um, at the beginning of this year, beginning of twenty twenty three, um, I um, I left Haltech. I left on great terms. Um, yeah, you still have a great relationship. Great relationship with those guys. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. I, I go over there all the time and use the Hub Dino, um, and um, uh, buy and sell and install and tune a lot of the Haltech product. I'm still involved with the R&D department over there. I've helped them out with some projects and tested some stuff for them. And so, yeah, great relationship. Didn't leave on bad terms. Just it's time for me to move on. Time for me Different to, chapter. Different chapter in my life. Different chapter in my career. And um, I learned a tough lesson uh, a couple of years ago um, back in the beginning of 22 um, when my dad passed. And, you know, I that the lesson I learned was life short, do, do, do what you love to do. And, um, as much as I love working for Haltech, um, I, I, it was really time for me to break away and do what I love to do, which is, you know, work on race cars. And, uh, not that we didn't do that there. We did a lot of that there. Yeah. But, um, um, but I wanted to do it uh, for myself. And so I, I started, um, formed, uh, our company, which is, uh, barely able racing. And, um, uh, which is right now just me in my garage, um, which is great. I love it. Um, I can wire race cars in pajama pants and <laughs> go inside and get a snack whenever I want. It's fantastic. Um, um, <laughs> I really do love it. Um, but it's, uh, it's, uh, you know, it's with any business, you know, it can be stressful at times and you've got customers that want, you know, want stuff done and, and, um, you know, scheduling customers in cause I'm, you know, like I said, I, I don't, I now Right now, that's what I want. That's that's the way I want it. Um, I don't want more than one car at a time. I don't want to, you know, to have more than one or two projects going at a time because I'm just one person, and that's yeah, it's good enough. I mean, I'm still I'm still remote tuning stuff and dyno tuning stuff and going on field trips like I did today to come up here and help you guys on Charlie Brown. But you know, um, but I don't have a shop full of fifteen cars to work on that you know that customers are tapping their feet wanting me to get it done. I'm I'm um, I want to. Right now, what's good for me is to stay, to stay small, keep keep control over everything, and do one one project at a time. What I really finish on is what you know, or what I sorry, <clears throat> excuse me. What I really focus on is um, what did we call it earlier? Race car finishing. Tur yeah, you call it turn turn, turn key and turn key turn key in a car, or I call it finishing, which is 
you know, the customer gets their, they, they get their race car from you guys or whoever builds their chassis and, or they buy a rolling chassis or something and they're put, they put their motor in it and they, you know, they build their turbo kit and their fuel system or their blower kit and whatever they, you know, whatever, whatever the combination is going to be. They put the whole car together mechanically. It's ready to go. And then they bring it to me and, um, I can wire it. Um, if it needs a little bit of fabrication work, I, I'm not building chassis, but if it needs a bracket built or if it needs a mounting plate thing done or, you know, or even if it needs a pipe made for a, you know, you know, cooler pipe or something, I can do, yeah. after, you know, small fabrication stuff. Um, I actually enjoy the, a little bit of fabrication. I try to do like a little fab job every week because it's, um, it's almost therapeutic after like staring at wires and stuff all the time. Um, I enjoy that part too, but, um, but we can do that and then we can make sure that all the electronics are working. Um, I prefer to ha- install Haltech ECUs cause that's what I know. Cause I worked there for 15 years. Um, that's that, definitely your expertise. It's where my expertise is. It's not to say I couldn't do another one, but I've got enough business lined up just doing Haltech stuff and setups and wiring and stuff that, that right now I'm not, I'm not taking any of the other brands on, not to say I couldn't in the future. Um, we'll, we'll see how things go, but, um, but I really know the ins and the outs of the Haltex system yeah. than anything. So, so, I, you know, I, I like to get a car in, you know, put, put, put the Haltex system on it, um, finish whatever, fix or finish whatever needs to be fixed or finished on it. And then, um, a lot of times we'll take it and put on the hub dyno. Um, MC says you put on the hot hub dyno, not to see how much power it makes, but to see what's going to fall off the car. Yeah. Make, make sure nothing falls off the race car before you take it to the racetrack. Um, that's a great, great, great process. We've had a lot of success doing it that way. Um, yeah, I mean, it personally, like, you know, last year we, we had a mad rush to get our car done. Obviously <clears> we're <throat> doing that again this year, but, um, you know, I guess we don't learn, but, but anyway, we, you know, we would go to the hub, we tested everything. Like you go to the racetrack, minimal issues, right? Like, yeah. and that's, well, that's the idea. Yeah. yeah. And I think, you know, people get in my mind, like people are always like, oh, it's going to be, you have new race car blues. Well, you shouldn't. You don't have to. You don't have to. You can, you know, there's there's people that are really good at this. Yeah. And I, I think that's, in my opinion, what you do is one of the more, it, it, you know, people a lot of times they value the chassis or they value the motor or they value all these things. Uh, and then they get, you like, you're like, we talk, you're the last guy. And, and honestly, I think that one of the beautiful things of what you do is that if the person made it to you, they're probably going to finish their race car. I hope so. You know what I mean? Like they're, you, we've, the chassis guys already took their money. The engine guys already took their money. The transmission guys already took their money. They might not have no money left when they get to you. Hopefully they got a yeah. few dollars left to yeah. pay me. <laughs> but they've made it through this whole thing and yeah. they're still wanting a race car. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. you know, I, you're welcome. You know, we felt the weed them out. Uh, <laughs> which, so I think the customer you get is probably the best customer because, <laughs> You know, they they really have went through the trials and tribulations of the car. Yeah. Um, but I do think that a lot of times they get to that last part and these cars really are, you know, like like you said, you you're dumbing it down, but they are, you know, every time I watch F one, I'm like, Well, we're idiots because they're way but yeah. for what we do, they are for the average person, they are a pretty sophisticated thing. Um, and taking it to somebody like you, um, really helps you finish strong and i think there's there's just not as much value put on that as there should be well in my opinion the double-edged sword to what i said earlier about the biggest advantage of having all these systems integrated and all these systems that work you know is that they all have to be wired up right and tested and configured and you know um like we were talking about earlier when a race car is done it's not done you know you you still got a day you know, like the car's ready to fire, but you still got a day to like set all the stuff up and, you know, it, you know, test everything, make sure that the, the buttons and switches work and make sure the injectors work and make sure the coils work, make sure it runs. You got to get it running too, yeah. obviously, but make sure that the shifter works and the, you know, the drive shaft sensor and the, you know, whatever else you got on the race car, you know, make, make sure even that stupid, um, cabin light that we put in there for you uh, today which you're really excited about. i'm so excited yeah um make sure that works you know and so there's there's time that it takes and it's it's just as important as getting all that stuff set up it's just as important in the success of the race car as 
making sure that the tires are, you know, the the, the chassis straight and, the, and the, the front front alignment's correct and the four link bars are right and the ride height's right. It's, it's, it's it all, goes all into the package. Um, yeah, absolutely. That's where you win the races. Absolutely. You know, is, is at the shop. And yep. I mean, and like if you're, you know, the average today, just one little thing, like we added, um, we added an air launcher. So I got a button on the steering wheel mm-hmm. for which again, it's just safer, better. We put a VPS in the car, safer, better, all those things. But, you know, Brad just threw one thing out. He's like, well, I don't want you to hit it. Be that guy that's going in, bumping in. Oh, I don't have to bump in. But going in the lights and accidentally hit the big red button, and then the shoe comes out. Mm-hmm. And you're like, okay, no big no big deal. I'll put this, this, and this, and then it won't come out until it sees. Yeah, I'll just put a condition in there that it won't hit the air launcher until you're you know, at a certain speed or a certain drive shaft speed or something like that. Exactly. You can do it at anything you want. But, yeah, we put a condition in there so that the car has to be going a certain speed before it'll actually deploy the chute. So that way, you know, it won't let you deploy the chute unless you're at least you know, half track or something. Yeah, and that's that's one, the idea, and that's one less way to lose a race. Yeah, yeah. So like a person like you, with what you do, you're providing people with all these one less thing to lose the race. Yeah, yeah. A uh, really good example of that was, um, and and look that 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 blue um, new edge car that we put together um, that I race. You know, it's there's there's not special to it. It's just a Mustang chassis with a, you know, with a um, turbo. It's not an LS. It's an LT. But yeah, yeah, uh, similar, sim- you know, sm- small block with a turbo, and and we put that thing together and we followed that process. We checked everything before we took it to the racetrack. We put it on the hub dyno. We tuned it. We made we knew it made make power. We spooled it up. We bumped it. We made sure that that would wall worked. We checked the shifter. We checked the 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 dump valve and we checked the boost controller and we checked this and checked that and we just made sure everything was going to work and then we worked on the chassis we you know we scaled it we set the ride height we we squared up the chassis um, Martin came down and helped me with that um, we set the front end alignment you know we set the shocks we set, we did everything and we spent days doing all that stuff and then we took it to the racetrack this has been three years ago we took it to the racetrack and um, you know I. I'd never been that fast before. You know, fastest at that time, the fastest I'd ever been was in my white Corvette, which was five teens in the eighth, something like that. And it took everything it had to do it, you know. Yeah. And you know, I like go of the button on the on the. Um, I, I told the guys I was going to run it to the to the gear change on the blue car. I, I said I'll, I'll run it to the one two gear change and, and lift. And um, so I let go of the button, and it went like one eighteen sixty foot, which at the time was faster than I'd ever been. But yeah, eighteen. This yeah, it probably felt like a rocket ship. It felt like a rocket, yeah. You know, and um, and it made the gear change, and I was like, "Cool, it shifted gears." And by the time I had that thought, I was across the eighth mile, you know, and and um, it went four eighty four or something like on the first hit. But everything worked; it all just you know it just went right down the racetrack. It was yeah, then it happened so fast. I'm like, "Wow, that was awesome." You know, then we kept on working after that. But it was it just shows that process, and and um, you can apply that same process if you got a five fifty car or a four ninety car or a or a or a three ninety car. It, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. The process is, you know, check and check and check and make sure everything's gonna work and make sure the thing's tuned and make sure it's not gonna, you know, go down the racetrack and cough and stumble and you know, and hopefully you don't have any problems, you have a lot more success. And uh, you know, that's not to say that you don't run into problems. We've had problems. You know, you guys you know, if you're gonna race yeah, yeah, yeah. and if you're gonna race cars, you're gonna have problems. But at least if you've already checked it once you understand how the systems work. And so when you do have that problem, diagnose it easier. If you understand you know, if you've got the sensors and the data and the, you know, all this stuff to be able to check it, it makes it easier to fix when you do have a problem. Absolutely. Yeah. I think the diagnosing, that's a huge thing. Yeah. So it, and obviously you're a part of a lot of really successful race programs. You have, um, you know, a lot of really good racers that you've worked with, worked on all these things. If you had to pick like one or two things that was common and those that group of people that made them successful what would what, what would you pick that to be drive drive the drive to be successful I, um <clears throat> back in 2017 i was helping um a uh, pro mod racer steve summers is a friend of mine and he was running nmca pro mod and um he was not leading in the points but he was second or third or something like that he had a bad outing in Indy. Uh, sorry, 
not not Indy, Norwalk was the second to the last race. Had a bad out, outing, tore it up, and you know didn't win the race, didn't get any points, whatever it was. It was, it was a bad day, and um, um, I don't remember if it didn't shift. It goes back to yeah, yeah. The, something in the process was broken. Something wasn't working right for him, you know. And so um, um, he was running a Haltech system, and he asked me to help him get the transmission to shift right or something. What but it was. So we worked on it between that race and the next race. And, you know, he had to um, work and, you know, build a couple new motors and we had to get all this stuff to shift right. And we had to test it and test it and test it. And then we went out going into the finals, um, the final race of the year. We had to, we had to win the race. Uh, whoever was leading in the points had to go out in the first or second round. And then we had to go in and win the race for us to have a chance to win that championship, for Steve to have a chance to win that championship. And, um, um, that's exactly what happened actually. And the thing, it kept missing gears. The previous races, it, it was, what, what was happening was it was a Liberty transmission and they had those, they remember that clear acrylic shift control, mechanical yeah. shift control box. Well, this thing was shifting time between the gear shifts was like less than half a second on the it's three, three. Yeah. yeah. It, it, it couldn't move fast enough. So he said, can we do this electronically? And, um, and so we figured out how to do it and use the ECU to put, we just put air solenoids on it and just told the ECU to hear shift, bang, shift, bang, 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 yeah, bang. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And it went through that race and it never missed, you know, that, that final race and it never missed a gear and it shifted perfectly. And, and we ended up winning the race and won that NMCA championship. But the, it, there had to be a lot of drive to like get the thing back together, test all this stuff, you know, go out there. And, um, I remember when it was all over, you know, and he, he came back from, uh, taking winter circle pictures or something, and he just fell down on the ground on his pit mat. He was just, he was just exhausted. And I'm like, that. There's a lot of drive there. Um, there's a lot of, you know, um, fierceness to be a competitor to, to do whatever it takes to win. Um, I've seen that in, in in other guys as well. Um, last year when we were at, uh, we were at World Cup, and I was helping Martin, and we had, um, we did really well in qualifying. You know, that that race you've got two, three days of qualifying and, you know, we sort of breezed through that and we, we qualified at the top of the field and, and, um, we were running wild street class as wild street, wild street. And, um, he didn't have a whole lot of problems, um, you know, through, um, through qualifying. And then on elimination day, anything that could have gone wrong did, you know, one run, it didn't shift because the trans brake didn't reset or something. I don't remember what happened, but I figured it out. I don't remember what it was, but it, as soon as it did it on the racetrack, I knew what it was and came back and fixed it immediately and fixed it so it would never do it again. But it was just something we had missed. And it, yeah. you know, had to be a certain scenario. And, you know, but luckily he got by that round. And then I'm trying to remember what all happened. One run, we came back on one of the nitrous, it was a nitrous combo. And um, one of the nitrous lines had burst. And so it had this big, this big bubble in the plastic sheet yeah. around the, you know, so it was about to lose a nitrous line. So they fixed that and they came back another round and, it was leaking. The oil pan had a crack in it, so we had to, like, well, anyway, whatever. Yeah. We sealed it up. Yeah. But I remember um, I, we were cutting a piece of metal to put on the thing to hold. Anyway, I looked down. My le- I'm, I'd cut myself with a piece of metal, and I'm bleeding on the on the thing. <laughs> I'd blow it all over my shoe. And, and Martin's, his whole crew, they're all thrashing to get this thing fixed for the next round, and we're going into finals or semifinals, and it was just like this this mad thrash to like make it to the next round, make it to the next, fix this, fix this, fix this, fix, you know, we had to fix something almost every single round. It, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't just a cakewalk. It was like that. They, they had to, you know, it was a lot of endurance. Oh yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And so that's, you know, the, the, the to answer your question is that the, the, the determination, the drive to, to be successful. The yeah. win. Yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. No, I think uh, when I, analyze that i think uh to have problems but not get rattled yeah you know the yeah. ability to yeah. not pack it up and go home but yeah but just like it, move yeah on. that okay that's a you know it, it that's a problem it's you know you, you acknowledge that it's a problem but then that never after that acknowledgement there's no backpedaling from that it's just okay we're gonna fix mm-hmm. this you know just yeah um it, 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 a, lot, a lot of guys with that spirit a lot of guys that race with that spirit yeah um um, that the, just t- two examples, but yeah, a lot of guys race with that, you know, must succeed anything at all costs sort of yeah. attitude. Um, and, uh, 
you know, it's something I admire. <clears throat> Me too. Because if my junk breaks, I'll take it home. And, you know, <laughs> That's not necessarily I'm, true. Uh, uh, yeah, I'm not putting a converter in the racetrack. <laughs> <laughs> I, I doubt that you would you would do it. If, yeah. Yeah, it's a turbo car though. You don't have to do that. Yeah. We never break it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we'll break it. It's a nitrous car. Right? I, uh, see, if you want to see would, people with drive determination, you give them a nitrous car. That's the, and I wish that was true. We broke ours a lot last year. Yeah, you did have a lot of. Yeah, yeah we 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 yeah, we were pushing the limits and tore up a bunch of stuff. But yeah, it's called a brigade seat. So in closing, what what's something you want to leave the people with? What? Um, well, I guess obviously a little bit of. Um, uh, unashamed uh self-promotion yeah um well, that's kind of why <laughs> no i thought we were just having a chat yeah. <laughs> no you can you can find our um we've got a website it's uh uh barely able racing.com um which is more than able though actually that is, oh I, I never did tell you the story about where the name came from which is actually kind of funny so we were building that blue car and um the guys had a habit of whenever um we'd be working on the car and w whenever I'd have to, you know, go, uh, uh, poop. and, uh, <laughs> yeah. well, they'd cut parts off the car while I was going, you know, they'd get the saws all out while I'm going to use the restroom. Right. And, um, so I come back one time and one of our buddies, hot rod, he's, he's kind of a character and, and they've, they've cut all these parts off the car and they're doing wheel tubs or whatever. And he's looking at it and he said, well, that's another fine job by the barely able. And that's kind of where the name came from, and it just sort of stuck. Uh, that's been you know, three, three years ago, and then um, of course I incorporated that that name into the the company because I started calling ourselves you know barely able racing. It started as a race team, but but that's where it that's where it came from. Race team, e team. We like to eat too. Right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, look, even if we don't win the race, we're still going to eat. Well, yeah, we're yeah, going to yeah. get something to eat. Yeah, but Gash, no, Gash you, doesn't like going racing with us because we don't eat enough. Well, anyway. you'll starve at the racetrack. <laughs> we do. Yeah. I, I watch. I watch you guys come to the racetrack for a four four day, an entire four day. It was like ducks race or something. You're going to be there for a week, and you guys brought like one bag of chips and a and a two liter. <laughs> we did I mean, we took, but, a, took everything to get there. Gash, and then unlocked. <laughs> We had to win the championship. You know, having to eat. Yeah. <laughs> you come around, you come around wherever we're at. We'll we'll have a grill. We'll be cooking. Well, things. that's kind of what we bank on, right? We know, like, <laughs> if we get raise it at that point, the note press has been a little different because we're kind of out there on the island by ourselves. Mm -hmm. On the, you know, we've met new people, right? But, um, yeah, like we were always racing with Martin, and then when we were kind of racing local. You guys were always there. Uh -huh. I mean, there was people to feed Brad. Yeah, you know, but now you know we're really starving over here. <laughs> <laughs> to rely on the compassion of others to yeah we had to because yeah. yeah. like martin's wife she would always back us extra food and she well, put notes on it well she knows yeah to yeah. like hey mc feed the boys feed the boys yeah yeah because yeah, yeah. we yeah, yeah. weren't responsible enough to yeah. bring their own food yeah it was several races last year we set up the barely able racing hospitality tent and we had we grilled food and sort of invited whoever was passing by and it, uh, turned out really good we have a good time so That's cool. we it goes back to that lesson I learned, which is enjoy what you're doing. You know, you only got so much time. Enjoy it. Do what Absolutely. You do, do, do what you love to do. Yeah. So. But yeah, you can find us at uh, barelyableracing.com. You can find us on Facebook as well. Um, and um, yeah, if you, if you guys need anything, just reach out to us and, and I'll, I'll get back with you as quick as I can. And you know, if you need any wiring, training, whatever you need. I think the training thing, uh, you know, if you're watching this, that, um, if I was watching this, that would be the, the thing I think I would gravitate to the most, you know, uh, you know, obviously you can buy all the, 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 all the parts on your website. He's mm -hmm. a, Eric's a dealer for us. He's a dealer for Haltech, number of different people. Mm -hmm. Um, the, the companies and parts that I use that we use regularly that what I've got listed on there, and there's a lot more that I haven't got on there yet, but yeah. Yeah. But I think the training and the way that you can do it, that, that um you know kind of skype call or whatever you know whatever, whatever program that you're using uh man that's that's really valuable yeah. you know because you don't have to load up and go and like and i think just well, to I'll, clarify that is just for haltech stuff okay i don't know enough about the other brands to, yeah, to yeah no and that's for specifically yeah. for haltech only haltech you can do yeah this i i know just enough to train somebody on some haltech stuff but um, um I, I i just barely know enough to be dangerous on the other uh, platforms well, but what a tool though, to be able to, um, you know, what I've noticed that, you know, you can put out as much informational videos as you want, 
but a lot of times people don't realize that computes to their car. Like everybody, everybody believes their car is just like their kid. They're, they're independently special, Mm -hmm. right? So it is nice to, you know, that you can work them personally through their laptop, through that, Mm -hmm. like, man, that's a work on their specific stuff. Absolutely. It's been really valuable to the guys that I've done that with so far. Yeah. That's great. Oh, and I look to, you know, hope to grow that, that part of the business over time. Yeah. I think that's a great move, Mm -hmm. but well, man, thanks for coming and hanging out with us. Absolutely. It's always great. Yeah. So as always like, share, subscribe. We appreciate you share barely able racing. We'll obviously he'll be tagged in the post and, uh, hopefully drop down in the comments. If you liked episode one and we'll have some more sit downs and drop down there. Maybe some people that you would like to see in here with us. What, who would you like to get into their brain? I mean, look how big that brain is right there. The, the, there's got to be a lot of more interesting, better people to have in than me. So you did a great job. It's going to be a really good list of people that you're going to have in after this. So, but I was an honor to be the first. Yeah, you'll always be the first. I'll always be the first. <laughs> yeah. So, all right. Well, we appreciate you guys. See you later.